it's time to sit down and relax for the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A with your host, Doug. Hey there, Doug here. Happy Thursday. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe. This week's interview, it's a good one. I love the behind the scenes on the sequels that we're going to be covering. And actor Matthew Marsden, man, he really kicked it up a notch. Great behind the scenes stories while filming Rambo, talking about working with Stallone, Black Hawk Town, working with Michael Caine. So many great stories. And of course, growing up in England, having that Hollywood dream, he talks about all of it. Oh, and I just, I sold him short. He's a singer too. Had an album, Columbia Records, two singles that were in like the top 20, 30 in England. Oh yeah, and Destiny's Child did backup on one of his songs. Pretty wild. So we talk about Beyonce too. Well, I'm going to shut up because this interview is action packed. And now it's time for my chat with actor and singer, Matthew Marston. Great. How are you, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. What's going on? Nothing much, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know when Jamie reached out to you a few months ago, I know you guys definitely get busy. And then I'm happy that you, he, he was able to get back in touch with you because I loved you in Rambo, but we'll get to that. So, so what I like to do with these is really just find out how people got started. And I think your career is pretty interesting with some of the people that you worked with. So uh, just yeah. like any good movie or any good TV show, everything has a great story in the beginning. So where's your story begin? Where'd you grow up? Uh, well, I grew up in the Midlands in, uh, in a place called West Bromwich, which is kind of a, an industrial town. Okay. And, and I just, I always loved film. I always loved American film in, uh, particularly. And I, had, I kind of had a dream of, of doing and being in Hollywood films. But, you know, it, it's, you know, normally it's just not seen as a possibility, you know, because I think over in the UK, uh, apart from a few uh, notable people like Michael Caine or, you know, Gary Oldman, it's very much a, a class-based thing. You know That's what I mean? true, I yeah. Was very much, yeah, I was very much working class. So uh, I, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm probably never going to, probably never going to get through but I, I had a dream of doing it and I just got my head down and and I think it was part part and parcel of that is watching American films and and having that kind of can-do attitude you know that if I put the work in then I'll get there eventually and, and that's what I did yeah what is there one particular movie that you remember growing up and like a, what age was this Oh, well, I always used to, I always kind of daydreamed, I think. I mean, I remember <laughs> when I saw Star Wars, you know, the first Star Wars was one for me that was, that was well, like for many people, it, it really, it really made an impression. And then I think that, that Rocky actually was a, a massive influence because it made me feel like, you know, if you work hard enough, it doesn't matter where you come from, that you can eventually make it. And, and then it was proved like, you know, 20 odd years, or well, however many years later, that I end up being in a movie with Stallone. And I think that that could probably only happen in the United States of America. So, so that was really the, the inspiration. And, and, you know, I went off and I did, I did all the usual things. You know, I did a, I did what they call in England. Uh, well, I did my GCSE in, in drama. Then I did an A-level in theater studies. Then I went off to do a um, degree in performing arts. Um, so, and then I actually came out before I finished the degree because I was getting work. So I was, I was very fortunate. When did you like start pursuing it like full time? Was it like the young Americans? That's the first role that's on IMDb. Well, the young Americans was, it, that was an interesting thing because I was at a uh, national youth theater at that point. And national youth theater is kind of like the, the premier youth theater in america in, in england so i was very fortunate to to audition for that and get into the national youth theater and from there they kind of tapped up a few of the young actors and said hey do you want to just come along and and basically be background and it was you know it was vigo and and a few other oh yeah big people yeah and i was like yeah you know i'll come along and do that so that was really like my first experience of film uh but i've been doing you know i mean it's you can't really you know, say that that is a, a proper acting role. It's it's just basically oh, yeah. being on set. You know what I mean? So it was my first experience of being on a set and it was really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And that was where the, you know, it was kind of nice going and saying, well, you know, I always wanted to do this and, and I've 
you know, being on set now and I really enjoy it. So let's hope that I can make a career out of it, you know, and and I always thought that I never really wanted to pursue theatre, even though we all, you know, most British actors have a background in theatre, which I did as well, but it wasn't really where I wanted to go. I always wanted to do movies. You know, that was always my goal. So so in between the, the Un-Americans, I'm sure it shot, the year before it came out, but so it's like around 93. And then how did you get the role in Emmerdale? Uh, Emmerdale was, I, I was basically known over there because to pay my way through college, um, because I didn't have anyone that could, uh, that could fund me. I basically, I modeled and I got a reputation of getting all the commercials. So I, I, I just turn up to commercials and get them because I had a back uh, in acting background. And I really hated the modeling because, you know, it was a, it's a really weird thing, you know, when you don't see yourself in the way that other people see you, yeah. you know, I always would, I was just like, you know, I want to be seen. I want to, I want to act. And so I got an agent from there and, and that's what happened. My agent said, Hey, listen, there's a, um, there's this role coming up on Emmerdale. Do you want to go up for it? It was my first proper audition. It was my first real acting wow. audition. And I got it. Yeah, and I got it. it. So I was yeah. like, yeah, I'm one for one. And then, <laughs> and then after, I came out of that, after I came out of that show, I went up for the what was the biggest show on, on British television's Coronation Street, and I got it. <laughs> so that was it. You know, I was two for two pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing to, yeah. especially right out of the gate to get two series like you said coronation street huge show and you're on that for a yeah. while you're in a lot of episodes of that yeah i did it for a year um i didn't i loved it it was one of the one of the happiest times for me as far as an actor because you know it's real like learning your uh your craft over there and also those shows make you massively famous so it was in, in the uk so it was a real um, a real moment, you know, where you start experiencing that kind of fame, like not being able to walk down the street, which, which you pretty soon realize that it, that it's um, a very surreal experience. And I had a lot of, I have a lot of um, sympathy for people that can't deal with it. You know, uh, it, it's, it's very strange. You don't really expect it. You know, one day you walk up the street and you get your sandwich and, you're a regular guy. And then it was my birthday, I believe, uh, 3rd of March, 1997, uh, that my first episode was on. And the day after that, I couldn't walk down the street anymore. So it, wow. was, a, it was a very, yeah, it was a very strange thing. But, um, you know, and then winning the award there um, for best newcomer, or most popular newcomer, you, you know, it's, it's what you kind of dream of getting. Yeah. Um, so I was very lucky. I was very fortunate. Uh, I worked hard, but you know, there's a there's always a massive element of luck and being in the right place at the right time with those things. And but I only ever wanted to do it for a limited period of time because I just wanted to challenge myself in other ways, you know, and do other roles. You know what I mean? Oh no, definitely. I know. I know you say. I, I know a lot of people I talk to. They, they say like that. You obviously it's the it's there's luck involved, but when you have that moment, you have to nail the audition. So no, that's great. You're able to do that. And then what the other show you were on too? It's called The Island. That was hosted by Bear yeah. Grylls. Oh no, no, that's a different thing. Um, the, oh, okay. The Island. Yeah, no, no, no. What, that, that's a different show. The Island was again. It was. I, I came out of. I can't remember. Whether it was. I think it was. Yeah, it was after Emmerdale, and I went in for this audition to play a surfer on a on a TV show, and I got it. So, uh, yeah, so actually it must have been, I'm not, I'm not sure whether that was before or after. Yeah, no, actually, so that's right. So the first audition I got was, was Emmerdale. Second one was, uh, I think I got Island. I got, that was an offer. I didn't have to audition for it. And the third one oh, was, wow. um, was Coronation Street. Yeah, so I, I did two auditions. But Island came to me. It was a, a children's TV show. And it was really great, actually. It was a, a really great bunch of people. And it was in Jersey, which is a uh, you know a little island, not 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 Jersey like I, here. That's where uh, I'm at. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, you are. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. It was the original Jersey. The, the original. <laughs> yeah, the original, the OG Jersey, which was just it's kind of a place. It's north or, or, or just off the coast of France and in between France and England, and it was it was really great. So yeah, so that's I three that. years in a row, right in the beginning of your career, ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven. 
You're a busy guy. So all during this time, you you were singing and. Well, you know, the singing thing was was always a. Um, it's a survival thing, you know, because when you, for me, when I started off, you know, nothing's ever guaranteed. It's certainly never guaranteed in the UK. Yeah. You know, so. I just thought I better be able to do as many things as I possibly can Definitely. to maximize my chance of actually working, you know? So, so then I'm like, you know, normally the problem in the UK is, you know, you go through, you do your training, then you go to theater and, you know, you get the third spear carrier on the right, you know, in a, in Coriolanus or something, if you're lucky, and then you work your way up uh, and, and then you might get a musical. So I thought, well, you know, I, I'm not really a dancer, uh, so I better, I better learn how to sing. And, and so when I was going through uh, my performance arts uh, degree, I did a lot of singing. I had a band, and my band that I was working with, there was a couple of guys that just weren't committed, and I was just always completely driven uh, to actually get something done. I didn't want to mess around. So I sang, and, and actually before I did either of those shows, I'd actually been offered a recording contract before then, but I didn't think like, I didn't think that I was ready for it. I didn't think I was mature enough to do it. And even looking back now, I'll probably put a little bit too much trust in people. Um, you know, even when I took on my, my, um, you know, when I, when I signed my, my, um, contract with Columbia records. Yeah. Um, but you know, you never know, you know, you never know. You hope that you guided well and, and, you know, I've got a, I had a great opportunity to do a, to, to do a, an album at Columbia records, which was a dream. I, I'd, I'd had a couple of offers, um, from different record companies, but Columbia, because of its relationship with the United States and also there's a lot of actors, that uh sing or singers that acts that were on the label so i thought that was the best move for me and are you still in england at this time or did you make the trek over to the united states yet oh, i was in england uh but I, oddly enough the video for the hearts long design my first single was actually shot in new york um so i did come over and meet the big hen shows uh, head on shows at sony and that was kind of it was kind of a surreal experience you know meeting those really, you know, legends, um, in the music industry. So, uh, yeah, I did come over and meet them, uh, but I hadn't made the move to the United States yet. Was that, she is gone with, uh, destiny's child. Yeah. That's so, this, she's gone. That's crazy. She's gone. Yeah. Yeah. No, we did that. It, that was a, an interesting thing because I was, you know, recording the album and, and we were in the, um, in Sony in, um, in London and I'm playing this track that I'd, I'd already recorded the vocals on and, uh, and then in burst, uh, this guy and he's like, who's this? And I was like, uh, it's me. And he's like, Oh, you gotta, you gotta work with my girls. You've got to work with my girls. And I was like, okay. And, and it was Matthew Knowles. So we, we literally went down to the studio that afternoon and I met with them and we, uh, we recorded it. We re-recorded it, so it was uh, it's quite something. And I always, I already knew that. I mean, I loved their first song, "No, No, No," which was the the big hit with Wyclef oh, yeah. over there, and I I loved it. And and uh, you know, we went in and we went in and sat, I sang with Beyonce, and she was just you knew I knew right there. I came out and I went, "That girl is going to be the biggest star in the world. She's incredible." Wow, and she was just a, on a different level, talent-wise. You know, just singing, and she was maybe seventeen, I think, then. Uh, very sweet. Um, all the girls were sweet, actually. They were really, uh, really lovely. Yeah, so I was very lucky to to um, have been a part of that as well. No, that's a pretty cool experience. So then, so then, going back to your acting-wise, uh, the mm -hmm. next there, there's that on there, but Shiner. So that's where you're able to, yeah. you're talking about people that you looked up to and you're able to work with Michael Caine. Yeah, that was amazing. So I, um, uh, I, I saw that there was this movie being made, uh, called China and that they wanted a young boxer in it. And I've always, you know, dabbled in either martial arts or, or boxing. And, um, and so what I did was I actually took time off and I went, my, I'm very good friends with a guy called Richie Woodall and Richie Woodall, was at the time the WBC super middleweight champion of the world. Oh wow. So I called him up. Yeah. And I said, Hey Rich, can I, can I come train with you? Can you come and 
you know, put me through my paces and get me up to speed. So it's kind of funny. We went, to, he trained at a, a, a power station um, in, uh, in Telford. So we, it was like as, as rough and tumble as you can get. And I loved it. So I, I'd go there and we'd train every day. And uh, when I went into the audition, I, I auditioned for the director and he said, can you box? And I just said to him, I'll fight anyone for this role. <laughs> I said, I'll fight, I'll, I'll fight them. I said, put them in the ring. I, I might get my head kicked in, but I'll fight and I can box. So uh, he came up and he saw me fight and he was like, yeah, you got it. And, and then it was meeting with Michael Caine and, and working with him, which was just unbelievable. I mean, he's not only is he an incredible human being, uh, but obviously he's an amazing actor, but you know, I, I really tried to learn as much as I could from him uh, in the time that we had together. And he was incredibly gracious and, and just super hardworking, you know, just super hardworking. The training at a power station. That sounds like something that if you told that to Stallone, he would have put in like a, a Rocky movie. <laughs> yeah. You know, he probably, I mean, you know, he tends to do his, uh, his research on the actors that he brings in. So I'm sure he knew about it, you know, when, when it came to us doing Rambo. So I'm sure he knew, I mean, he certainly knew about my singing. Uh, he, he mentioned that when I very first met him. So uh, that was kind of funny. Oh, wow. We'll definitely talk about that. So that's cool. So you did that. You worked with one of your heroes. And then, mm -hmm. so, so the next big movie that you had was Black Hawk Down. So at this point, is are you still in England or are you coming over here? Because it looks like after that, every you were doing like two or three films a year. Yeah, well, what happened with that was I, I at the same time, I was auditioning for, the, for Star Wars um, because obviously I got, you know, doing a movie with a, a multiple Oscar winner yeah. gets a lot of uh, attention. And, and I, I just didn't know. And I always felt that if I was going to come to America, I didn't want to just come without having something behind me or, you know, not, I wanted to come and make something of myself here, you know? So uh, what happened was words started getting out, I believe about, about me and Shiner and working with Michael and he was nominated for Cider House Rules that year. And so I, um, I got a few calls from agents and managers and so they flew over to meet me, actually. And um, I met with one in particular, Vanessa Alexander, who was at Hamprint, which is Benny Medina's company, and Jeff Pollock. And uh, she said, uh, I got on super well with her. And she goes, listen, you should really come to America now, you know. And I said, okay. And she called me from the plane and she said, look, I really think you should come. I said, okay, I'll see you on Friday. <laughs> and she's like, oh, British actors always say that. They always say they come in. And, and I said, I'll see you on Friday. And I booked my ticket and I came over. And, you know, it was, it was amazing, you know, coming to Los Angeles. And, and, you know, it was a dream. It was a dream that I always wanted, you know, going onto the Paramount lot, the Warner Brothers lot, things that I'd, I'd looked at when I was a little boy and said, you know, that is, you know, that's the pinnacle of being an actor. And um, came over and I got the audition. I got it. Uh, and so <clears throat> it was kind of, it was kind of strange. I remember that my, uh, uh, one of the other managers at the company came into me at the time and he goes, you're not going home. I'm just telling you right now, you're not going home. And, <laughs> and it was a really, it was a really great time to come over to, to Hollywood. There was a lot of like, now we don't have, like those kind of movies. The movies now are either massive movies like the Avengers or, you know, and then um, the, the, the small ones, the indie ones. Yeah. But then, you know, a $25 million movie was considered to be, you know, a middle of the range film. And, um, and there was a lot of them getting made and it's not like that anymore, which is a real shame. You know, that's why you don't really get those breakout performances, I believe now. You know, yeah, from other if, actors. If you uh, notice it in the movie theater, if you go to the movies, there's not as many movies in the theaters as there used to be because there's so many different options. But no, you're right. No, that you know they're spending that kind of money on TV shows. You know, like yeah. Uh, so, and it's a shame because you know you don't. They're those kind of like 
interesting movies, uh, you know, some B movies, they you are know, like sub B movies kind of thing are in that in that bracket, and that's gone now because you know the the, the big stars are all taken up on these massive franchises. So it, it's unfortunate. But when I came, uh, there was a lot of that. So I, yeah, I got Black Hawk Down, and uh, I remember well. I auditioned for it here and then I went home and they were like, Oh, they like you for it. And, and I went back home. Obviously I met Will Ridley and, and Jerry Bruckheimer, which, you know, uh, two of my other idols. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're getting the phone call when they go, it's so funny. I, I, I don't know how actors can be cool about it because people go, you know, I've got the phone call and it's, Hey, listen, uh, Ridley Scott and Jerry Bruckheimer want to meet you. And it's just one of those moments where you're like, this is it. <laughs> you know, this, this, you know, it's Ridley Scott and Jerry Bruckheimer. I'm like, what? And you try and be cool when you go in there, but all the time, like for me anyway, I was like, oh my goodness, it's Ridley Scott uh, and Jerry, you know? And so I came back home and, and I got the phone call. It was really funny. I got the phone call at like midnight uh, over in the UK that I've got the role. And uh, I just, I got a bottle of champagne and I actually went around to my mom's and I, I, I I rang the doorbell and she came down. I said, "Hey, listen, I got the role," and it was uh, it was really awesome. And it was one of the greatest experiences of my life working on that movie. Where was that movie filmed? That was filmed in Morocco. So we were there like five months. Wow. Yeah. No. In, in the in the my earlier career, I did a lot of stuff all over the world, which was really nice. Uh, you know, because you get to travel and you get to stay in the nicest hotels and and be treated very well and, and have these amazing experiences. And so, you know, Black Hawk Down was, was particularly an amazing experience and, and exposed me and with a, a, I have a long-term relationship with the, the veterans in this country and, um, and in particular the uh, army. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was really amazing being a part of that and learning so much on it. And, um, yeah, it was terrific. That's great. Yeah. And that talking about like a super sarcast, like people that are already big at the time, but then some other people in like s- smaller ish roles that went on to do a lot of stuff. So that's pretty cool. It's really five months here with all yeah. those people. Yeah, no, I mean, and we all have, you know, we can all, we all, when we see each other, it's, it's a real camaraderie, you know, oh, that's and cool. I was in a weird, yeah, I was in a weird kind of, situation so i was like 27 i think around that when when i made that film and i was older than a lot of the rangers right so there was a lot of younger guys in there i mean not by much i mean you know maybe a couple of years but some of them were were very young and i was not quite as old as like bill fickner and kim coates and those guys so i was kind of and also my role in that film meant that i spent a lot of time with eric banner yeah. So, you know, I wasn't in with the with the main group of the, the Rangers, but I was with Eric because the other two guys that came into us that played the Delta guys were actually stunt guys. So I spent a lot of time uh, with both groups uh, while being in the middle of both of them age-wise, you know, uh, and, and it was great. I had, a, I had a lovely time and the cast was amazing. We were all very good friends. Uh, awesome. on that film and yeah it was it was really great so you mentioned a little bit before you you auditioned for star wars was that for i guess that was the second movie or was that the first of the prequels well i, I think it was, it was I, I don't know is the answer to that i'm not sure if it was for the first one i think it was probably for the second one but they were they were looking at us for the first and it was when i was shooting china so i'd get a phone call and they're like hey matt they want you to put you want yourself on tape again and uh one I missed the last part of it because I was actually shooting uh, a scene in China where um, where I have an argument with Michael Caine in the middle of the night, and we were shooting in the middle of the night, so I couldn't get my because back then it was like send your tape over. Yeah, right? it wasn't like that way. You just put it on the transfer and send the tape. And they get it forty minutes later. That was then you got to record it. You got to put it in an envelope. You got to FedEx it across. <laughs> and um, and yeah, so I did. I, I, it was like five or six or even seven auditions um, that they would call up and say, do it again and do it like this and do it again and do it like that. And I was on the short list um, for it. So it was uh, unfortunate that I couldn't make the last 
type that I was meant to send over, I couldn't do. Uh, do you remember what kind of role it was? I, d- I don't. They were very, it's one of those. And, and, you know, sometimes you, you know, in this industry, you'll have people go, listen, it's really top secret. And you're like, come on, nobody cares. <laughs> but when it's, you know what I mean? It's true. It's like nobody cares. I mean, I've had, I've had instances where I've had to go into Fox and I've had to sit there and read the script right there for two hours. And it, it's like, there's some movies that you go, okay, I get it. Like any of the Marvel movies, I get it. Um, uh, but, and, and with this case, it was like, we can't tell you, you know? And I'm like, okay, it's like Star Wars, <laughs> yeah. you know, I get it. It's Star Wars. So, uh, you know, it was the biggest thing at the time. So I don't know exactly what the role was and, and it's been a long time. And also, you know, I'm still digesting being on set with Michael Caine and Martin Landau yeah, and, yeah. and Andy Serkis, you know, so it's kind of like, well, you know, and it, I guess it's the naivete of, of youth. You're like, well, I'm doing this movie. I've just got to, you know, there are other things that are going to come. I mean, obviously Star Wars was, was so important to me, but I didn't know, uh, I didn't know where it was going to go or what it was for at that point. Yeah. You know? I can understand why they don't let scripts out because the one guy in the new Star Wars movie, he left it in his hotel under his bed and there was like a big thing about yeah. that. Somebody sold on eBay for like a bunch of money. But even like smaller movies, I just interviewed a guy that was in one of the Friday the 13th movies and he didn't know mm-hmm. until he showed up on set that it was a Friday the 13th movie. They called it like Ashes to Ashes and Jason's name was, uh, I forget what it was. It was like Ethan. So like they show up on set and then it's like, this is a Jason movie because they didn't want people to know. So yeah, I guess no yeah. matter what, they like to keep things hush hush. But so, so you mentioned before we were talking about like the B movies that would, they would make. And right after you do, well, a couple of years after uh, Black Hawk Down, you're in uh, Anaconda's The Hunt for the Blood Orchid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a funny thing. I was up for like four different movies at that time. Uh, really? And I didn't know which one I was, yeah, I didn't know which one I was going to do. And um, it, it were, I was literally saying, hey, guys, you know, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You know, which, you, you know, am I going to go to Prague? Am I going to get it? You know, and they called me up and they said, hey, listen, do you want to do Anacondas? And I was like, uh, uh, <laughs> and then they said, it's in Fiji and they're paying you a load of money. And and cause I, I actually hadn't seen the first one and, and I love John Voight. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, I was like, I was playing the villain. I'm like, the villain after John Boyd. And the, the other thing is, is around that period of time, because, you know, a lot of the time when you do a sequel, it's not always good. Right? Oh, I know. So I know. That's, like, what, that's what we do. We cover sequels. So, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, no. So, it, it's kind of hard, you know. And But then at the time, what a lot of people don't realize is because the first one had such an incredible cast, but you look back at the cast and that is insane. Oh, I know. Uh, for that kind of a movie. And uh, I loved Dwight, um, who was the director. He was amazing. And the, the vibe around town was, again, it was like, this is the new crop, you know, uh, following Owen and, and J-Lo and Ice Cube and all those guys. So whoever was getting this movie, you get a lot of momentum. And it was also in Fiji. And I'm like, I think I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> and it was also a villain. It's also a villain. And villains are always the best role. So I'm like, oh, yeah, that that'll be cool. great. I'll go over and do it. Was that your first, was that your first time playing a villain? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, so, you know, it was, it was a delicious role to go and do. And, and I love the people that were doing it. Um, and, and again, we're all still very good friends now and, you know, Fiji for three months, getting paid a lot of money. It's like, come on, <laughs> I'll go do that. And, uh, yeah, I'm like, we were outside in Fiji. It was, it was unbelievable. Oh, and, and I had a really, really great time. Yeah. That's so cool. No, I interviewed somebody that was in Crystal Allen. She starred in the third and fourth one. And I interviewed the director of the third one. And they filmed that one. It was in Romania. So that's why I was wondering if they shot it. So Fiji, that's, yeah, that, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, the, the producer was the original producer, Werner Hara from Hara Casinos. And, <clears throat> and you know, Jake Rose was the, the other producer. Like, really, really big producers. And also Dwight Little, who was a great director. 
That's you awesome. Know, so I was very, and, and I loved, I loved working with him, and I loved working. I mean, listen, we're all when you're acting, and you, you know, who was it said, you know, when you when you work and you do something you you love, you never work a day in your life again. Oh, so definitely. you know, doing a movie, it, and that goes for any movie that I've that I've done. You know, I consider myself to be very fortunate to have been able to make a career out of out of acting certainly in films and and you know you learn something on every single movie that you make i mean of course you know we'd all love to be you know doing the rambos and the and also you know the big oscar winning films uh but you know there are reasons for taking the the decisions that you make and I've, i've turned a lot of movies down for for other reasons you know so um, I just consider, you know, every day on the set to be a blessing. That's awesome. Man. You, you know, have a great which, outlook whatever. on it. Yeah, well, I'm very fortunate. There are thousands and millions of people that would love to do what I do, you know. No, I know. I interviewed a guy that was, uh, he was, I don't know if he was on, maybe on the board of SAG, but when he told me the number of people that actually live off of acting, it was like the smallest number and I could not believe it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like one percent. I think it, it, yeah. it, it's really, really small. One or two percent of the people that work they're in SAG, and, and you know, I'm coming up to being a SAG member for 19 years now. So, wow. um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been again, like I said, I've been very lucky, and um, and I, I love my job, and I get to meet great people like you, and and talk to oh, you, people that are fans. So, yeah. Oh, totally. So, so one movie I didn't know before we get into Rambo, it's this like in between Rambo and uh, Anaconda. And there's a few TV shows you're on, but I never knew this. They made a movie of this, but uh, Dead or Alive, were you able to fight in that movie? Yeah, it was. So, so basically, um, uh, a little bit of trivia. So, I was meant to, it's a long story on this. Now, I won't get into the weeds, but I was meant to work with Paul Anderson on Alien versus Predator. Oh, wow. And yeah, and it didn't work out. So Paul came back when they did this thing, Dead or Alive, you know, and, and you know, because Paul is kind of the king of the video game uh, movies. And we've got uh, Corey Yoon, who was, um, you know, I, I believe he was the fight coordinator on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or, or no, sorry, he was, he was the fight coordinator on X Men and a bunch of other stuff. And they got all the wire people and the stunt people from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And they came and they said, listen, we're going to do this film, which is based on the best-selling video game. We're going to shoot it in China. Uh, we've got Corey Yoon, who's one of the world's great stunt coordinators, like fight coordinators. And we've got the guys that did Crouching uh, Tiger, Hidden Dragon. So the wire work, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. And... Uh, you know, all the girls, we've got all the girls in to play the different roles and uh, and a couple of very interesting guys coming in and playing the other roles. And you can go out there and, you know, you can fight. So you get to you get to fight on it. And so I was like, great, you know, it's the end of China, three months, you know, doing a fight movie, uh, you know, and it was, you know, we all, we all thought it was set up to be this really big film. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way, you know. Uh, it's funny because uh, Michael Caine once said, you know, you never, you never go out to make a bad film, yeah, or you never go out to make a movie that that doesn't work. And what I think what happened with DOA was, um, it, you know, it was one of those that didn't quite do what it should have done, but it's become a little bit of a cult classic. You know, like it's a my buddy who says, you know, DOA is a guilty pleasure for me. Uh, so I'll go and watch it and to, to watch these fight sequences with, you know, Holly Valance and Jamie Presley and um, and Sarah Carter. And you know, so, you know, and Kane Kasugi is a, you know, Show Kasugi's son. So, you know, you're talking martial art movie royalty right there. Yeah. Um, and, and a bunch of other people. So, you know, we had some, we, again, a great time got to see you know before china was really opening itself up that much to film we got to go around and and shoot there which was uh it was both challenging uh and very interesting and i think you said it best you know like these the the video game movies are so hard to do because it really it's just that it's a fighting video game there's no story so it's hard to to do that but i'm looking at the trailer and i paused that apart 
and it's you standing next to Kevin Nash, which is pretty, pretty badass. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. Like, but so you know, this yeah. Kevin Nash was there, and um, oh my goodness, Derek Derek uh, Bowie, I think his, his surname is. So Derek was was one of the world's strongest men. Oh so, wow! For example, yeah. So we go out and train, and and I'd see these guys, and and Kevin would have. I always called it his comedy um, dumbbell because he had a dumbbell what most people would use as a barbell. <laughs> you know, or like, you know, the weight size. So we'd have these massive weights and I'd be like, Kev, this is just ridiculous. And with, um, with Derek, I remember seeing him one day and uh, I was like, Derek, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm going to go and train legs. I said, how are you going to train legs? And we were in the middle of China. There was, you know, nothing there then. He goes, oh, I'm, I'm going to do squats. And I went, well, what are you going to squat? And he said, the grip truck. <laughs> I was like, what? And he did. He went out and he picked the truck up. I, I, it's no joke and that's what he would do to train and Jeez. and kevin's like this you know kevin's massive I know. and he's, he's also hugely strong like people don't realize like those guys are so strong and by the way the sweetest guy you will ever meet uh and and i was not a, a follower of the wwe or wwf or whatever i mean yeah yeah and i didn't realize he was this like gigantic star and he was such a sweetheart and, and very patient when I would ask him a lot about training and, and, uh, and, and about, cause you know, I always like to take the opportunity to educate myself on the other people on the set in the sense that I'll go and ask them about their lives, oh, that's uh, great. not in an intrusive way, but, but, you know, I want to know, you know, if I don't know about his, his career, I'd like to know about it. And, and, you know, I mean, he, you know, those guys go through the wars, man. They get beaten up. Oh, yeah. Um, so, they work you know, like he, night in, night yeah, out. Seeing, he, oh, yeah, no, I mean, and he would, he gets battered, you know, he'd get, you know, chairs banged over him. And, yeah. you know, he, they're, they're real tough guys. They're really tough. And, and he's a great, he's one of the great guys. And it's great that you take a movie like that. Like you said, it didn't get the reception or come out the way, but you were able to, you know, have a great experience, meet a bunch of people, you're able to work with Eric Roberts, you know, Jamie Presley. And, yeah. And so that's pretty cool. So then right after that, you're in another, uh, you're in a sequel, uh, Resident Evil. Yeah. So yeah. So again, and Paul Anderson. Yeah, Paul called me and uh, and he was like, hey, Matt, listen, I'd really like you to come and do, uh, you know, Resident Evil. And he said, uh, Russell Mulcahy is directing it. And I'm like, the dude that did Highlander? Are you kidding? I mean, <laughs> you know, because I, I absolutely loved, uh, obviously loved Highlander. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was great. And so what, what I did was I flew down to Mexico City because we shot it in Mexico City and we did pickups for DOA so I was doing pickups for DOA down there in a studio and going and doing um, Resident Evil and so that was great because I love Paul and Mila and you know working with Ian as well I mean Ian's a, a really terrific actor and being a part of that was was really really great yeah it was a, a lot of fun uh, and again playing a, a kind of a bad guy but um, uh, I enjoyed it now working on set like so this is how many years removed from when you were singing and you did the song with Destiny's Child and you had your album come out. So you're working with Ashanti. Do people ever ask you, do people come up to you on set and learn about you? Is that something that you mentioned? Because that's kind of like a, kind of a fun fact. Well, it's funny because I think that, you know, it depends. Like it depends how long you're on a movie. And, yeah, that's and true. a lot of times, and, and a lot of times like, you know, you, you know, you don't overstep the boundaries, right? Like yeah. you want to be respectful of the other people. For example, just going back to China, one day I was doing a scene in the back of a limo and with Michael and we had some downtime and I turned around to him and I said, hey, Michael, I said, do you have any tips for me as a young actor? And he looked at me and he went, you're doing a fine fact, like that. And that was it. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Like, you know, all right. I kind of asked him because it's Michael Caine. <laughs> uh, and then I saw years later on a show in in the UK, he was asked about this. He said, I don't give people tips, he said, because when I was younger and I asked an actor for a tip uh, on my acting, he told me, yeah, quit. 
And I was like, oh, I know, because I did ask him and he didn't give me any tips. He didn't, <laughs> uh, you know, because he's generous. He goes, you, you're going to be doing great. So, you know, it's one of those things where someone might feel comfortable later, you know, yeah. bringing something like that up. Or, uh, I mean, it's like I said, Stallone did, uh, because, you know, I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's so multifaceted. You know, I mean, I think he didn't he write Rhinestone or something like that. You know, he, he's done such a lot of things that, um, you know, he he asks about it because he's he gets invest very invested in whatever he's doing. And that, I think that includes the people that he works with, you know. So uh, I've had a couple of people come up and say, hey, we, you know, you did this or you did that. Or, you know, what about this? What about that? I get it a lot. I actually get a lot. Um, of people asking me about the work I've done with the military and the training I've done with the military. Oh, that's cool. Oddly enough. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, uh, so, I mean, people do ask, but again, you know, you don't know how people, because it's funny in the industry, right? Some people might, you might, I mean, look at like an officer and a gentleman, for example. You, you watch that movie and you think that those two had a great chemistry and they hated each other. Yeah. So what you don't want to do is go and go, you guys were great in that film. And, you know, <laughs> she was, too, and they're like, oh, I hate that. Or I hate that director. So there is that kind of like, unless you, you get to know them, uh, like in my latest movie, I was stuck in a car with guys for hours. So you end up talking to each other and you start talking about different things, you know, so it all depends. Yeah. No, that's good. So, so let's talk Rambo. And I know you touched on it a couple of times. So, so you go on for the audition for that and Stallone like knew a lot about you. He knew about your singing. Well, what I'm with that was I, I, I got a call from my manager and they said, yeah, hey, listen, they're doing, they're doing Rambo. And Sheila Jaffe who's the casting director. who's one of the best casting directors in the world. Uh, it, she wanted to see me and I, I actually went in for Lewis's character for Graham's character in that and uh, I always kind of for the most part understate my role I always play down I play a lot of times against the way that it's written and so I, I, I did the scene and uh, I get a phone call and they're like hey listen um Stallone's going to call you they like you for schoolboy and schoolboy at the time I believe was uh, was a navy seal he was a SEAL team uh, sniper. And I was like, Stallone's going to call me? Like, what? <laughs> and I turned around like, nobody pick up the phone. Nobody pick up the phone. Because obviously, you know, I mean, I grew up, you know, looking up to Stallone, you know, from the writing aspect, from, from everything that he achieved in his career. I mean, when, when I grew up in the 80s, you know, he was the biggest star in the world. So anyway, he calls me and he, he basically says, do you want to come and hang out tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah. So I go around and, and I hang out with him and he's, you know, we start talking about different things. Now, you know, obviously he knew that I'd had a lot of military training and, you know, uh, I say military training, I mean like, you know, actor's version of military training, yeah. you know, like not the difficult stuff, but, you know, so we spoke about things, you know, we were talking about weapons, different kind of weapons. He was, and he's, he's incredibly well read. And yeah, and he said, you know, I, I think I want you to play Schoolboy. And, and in the original script, Schoolboy basically took over the franchise. So it was Stallone and it was Rambo and Schoolboy together, like almost as the, the Troutman and Rambo characters. Oh, wow. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So I was like super excited. I'm like, you know, this is amazing. You know, Stallone's directing it. Um and and yeah no I mean I I had some suggestions I, I suggested about him being an SBS guy and I, I told him about you know who the who the SBS was were you know he knew who the SAS were and I just said you know we we had a, a long conversation about character and he's like I said he's massively invested in these characters and and so yeah next thing I know we're going off to Thailand to make the film and uh, it is, it is an amazing thing about. Stallone so we get there and he walks over and he sees all the gear we've got on and you know they've spent a long time putting all this gear together and props and all this and he goes take that off take that off take that off take that off you'll die in the jungle like it'll kill you so he's what, what's amazing is that as a writer and as a director he also understands what an actor goes through 
and he knows how to get the best out of the actors. And it's a really incredible thing to see. You know what I mean? To see the synergy of all those different things come together yeah. um, to, to, to gel a cast. And, um, and, and you know, and, and also, he's the hardest working guy around. Oh, I know. But there's nobody. That, oh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like he's, you know, on set, he's directing. Then he's going to, he's acting in the scene. In the, you know, in between, he's like, you know, got this like stick with a, with a rope on, with a weight on the end that he's doing to work his forearms. And, you know, he's doing different exercises in between. No, and then, and then lunchtime goes, he goes and looks at the rushes. I mean, it's just full on. So, um, you know, there's a reason why he was the biggest star in the world for, you know, and still is, he's still one of the biggest stars in the world. And the dude just doesn't stop working. He's super hard working. So um, I learned a lot on that movie with him, a lot. Yeah, your role was really cool in the movie. That guy that you, the Lewis character, that guy was like super evil, you know, the, the mercenary. But that movie, I'm sure there's movies before that where that, that were that over the top with the, the kills and just how graphic it was. But I remember seeing yeah. that movie in the movie theater. I took a, I took a date and that, would, that relationship, <laughs> I, that was like the only date we had. But uh that movie was so yeah. over the top with some of those scenes. I watched it not too long ago. And it's just like, oh man, that movie is so cool. And you know what's awesome? So there's a video somebody made on YouTube and somebody did like a, a compilation of your character and Tim Kang's characters kills. Like each thing they huh. come all together. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, mine are, mine are cooler than Tim's. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, it's uh, what I think that, you know, Sly wanted to bring attention to the Burmese and what they were doing over there and the way they were brutalizing the Karen people. I mean, even though, you know, people look and they say, oh, you know, Rambo and they might dismiss it. Um, you know, I think because after First Blood, which I, I think is, is it just an unbelievable film. Um, and then you went Rambo two and Rambo three, which I, I actually love both of those films. Oh yeah, um, I, I, I love them. I mean, these are the ones that you know. Those are the movies that went as a kid. You like, I need to get down to the gym and work out. And also, <laughs> yeah. I believe that it made people it made people absolutely terrified of of the Green Berets, the Special Forces. So I love those movies. But if you think about it, he, he was always in that writing. He's always trying to to shine a light on certain issues but you don't hear him talk about it so so like the, the Burmese have brutalized the Karen people for years and years and years and they have a very very tense relationship with the Thais and and when we were over there like you know we were under constant threat of getting killed uh wow. they and certainly he was he was uh, and he's he was the biggest target I don't think they really cared about if they got any of us but you know you, you, you know they they certainly he was brave enough to go all the way over. I, I know actors that won't even leave America. Right? And Sly's like, no, nope, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to go right on the border with Burma. And, uh, and they used to get like phone calls. I'm going to kill you. And then they'd hang up. So um, he, yeah, no, he really wanted to make a statement. And I think, it, you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, it's graphically violent. But the truth of the matter is, is, those things are graphically violent. I mean, I know that the end of the movies is, you know, probably one of the most violent yeah. movies of all time. Yeah. I mean, it really is. But, but it, it, I think it's also a reaction. It was also kind of like a throwback to, to the early 80s and people were fed up again in this kind of like sanitized version of, of war. And he was just like, okay, I'm going to show it. And I think to a degree that we thought that it was probably going to be not passed you know by the censors but yeah. they did stayed oh, no. in i mean uh, you know uh, and and you know i mean look i mean rambo is never you know if you watch that film you know he's he's tortured all the way through that film oh i know you know he's, he's a really tortured soul so it's not like it's not like hey yeah you know i'm gonna go off and kill a bunch of people i'm having a great time in my life you know it's it's like you know you see the the ramifications of it and at the end of it you know none of us are i mean we're all beaten down yeah um you know so i think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there 
to unpack. But yeah, I mean, on the other hand, it's a great movie. I remember going with my buddies when I blow the guy's heads off and they're like, whoa, <laughs> yes, that's awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, dude. And again, it just shows, you know, I, I think you're only as good as the material that you get and the direction, you know, that you get. And and the material is good. You know, it's, it's very good. And, and my character was very cool. And he wrote it like that and he shot it like that. So that's awesome. So, so one thing I really want to spend a lot of time on with you, because thanks so much for taking the time. And I know this means like a lot to you is the movie mm-hmm. that I, it's called I am that man. Yeah. So I, I watched the trailer. It looks really cool. Is that out for people to see? Not yet. It's about okay, to come cool. out. So I, yeah, no, I, um, Okay, so the little story behind that is basically after I did Black Hawk Down, I've been involved a lot with veterans and veterans' causes and 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 basically seeing what our heroes go through when they come home. And, you know, they get very frustrated with the way that um, veterans and the military are portrayed in movies. And yeah. I was very lucky that Black Hawk Down is – that aren't military don't understand this, but Black Hawk Down is kind of seen as the the movie for them. Uh, you know, it, it, it holds a special place in all these guys' hearts, guys and girls' hearts, you know. Oh, wow. So uh, for a long time, but, you know, they get the people that I've spoken to. I, I don't want to talk about, you know, people as a monolithic block, but I think that, you know, the, the guys that I spoke to and the girls that I spoke to, mainly dudes are like people don't portray us correctly. You know, they, they portray us as crazy, um, you know, wackadoodles that, you know, are unhinged or they drink all the time and this, and they don't really touch on what we go through when we, when we come home properly and the issues that we go through when we come home. And so what I did was I, I wrote a screenplay. I'd already written one screenplay that I sold. I, I just did it, you know, for, I don't know, I'll see if I can do it. And I, I wrote the screenplay. I mean, after reading thousands of screenplays, yeah. you know, you get a feel for it. And and I wrote one and I sold it, my first one. So I'm like, huh, okay. <laughs> so I wrote, I wrote the second one. And again, it just got a lot of acclaim. Um, and, and that was I Am That Man. And so what I did was I wanted to show the juxtaposition of, you know, when a guy is an absolute rock star, you know, when he walks onto a base in Kandahar or, or wherever it is. And when he comes home, he gets treated like a Yahoo. You know, people look down, not necessarily because of the person that they are, just the attitude that people have to other people in life. You know, uh, if you work at Home Depot uh, or or wherever, you know there there's a lot of people that have that elitist attitude, where they speak that they'll talk down to you and and you know look I come from a very working class background so yeah. I'm I'm very well aware of that, and uh, and and my thing is is I treat every single person the same, you know my grandmother cleaned toilets for for a living you know and and she was one of the greatest human beings to ever walk this earth, right? So so what I wanted to show is, you know, these guys come back and they're massively skilled, but what do you do when your skill is shooting people at, you know, 1,500 yards? Yeah. You know, or being an expert in assaulting, uh, uh, you know, assaulting buildings or, you know, uh, I've got a friend right now that's coming back who's just deployed and, you know, as an Air Force PJ, and, and, and they're massively skilled, right? But what do you do when you come home? And, you know, what do you do? Oh, well, I can halo into any country you want, and I can exfil. So there's a very unique um, job mark for those kind of guys. So a lot of guys come back, and even not the Special Forces guys, the Special Operations community, regular folk come back, and they're kind of, they lose their brotherhood, you know, because they've got a guys next to them they know would die for them. Yeah. You know, they lose they lose a lot of the time their sense of who they are because, you know, being in, in the Navy or in the Army or in the Marine Corps or, or the Air Force, you know, there's no identity to that. And they come and they're like, 
you know, now I work at Home Depot and people talk to me like crap, right? You know, I, you know, talk down to me or, or yeah. And, and just dealing with, you know, that thing, which is as a man, it's the, the greatest thing that you can do is provide for your family, right? Like be a family man and provide for your family eventually. So, you know, this guy comes back and, and he's, he's doing a job because he wants to see, he wants to build a relationship with his son. I think there's, and certainly in the special operations community, there's almost like an 80% divorce rate. Uh, so he's, he's trying to keep his family together. He's trying to work on that. And so I wrote this script, which the under, the, the whole underlying um, story is him and his wife and his son. And it's set up against this backdrop of his best friend, um, mentor, is an older Jewish guy, is killed by some neo-Nazis. Oh, wow. And he gets frustrated because the police are just completely snowed under. They're trying to do their best to to track down who were the killers and they don't. And he's like, I have the skill set to go after these guys. So I'm going to go after them. And that's what he does. So it's like, it's kind of like a vigilante movie in one way. I like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a mix of the two, but for guys that were former military, there's a lot in, so I sent them the script away to a friend of mine, Craig Sawyer, who's a, a SEAL team six, former SEAL team six sniper. And he went through it, he critiqued it. Another guy who's a, a Purple Heart recipient called Matt James, I sent the script to him. He went through it. I sent it to a, a veterans advocate by the name of Boone, Boone Cutler, uh, who uh, wrote a book called Voodoo Inside a City. He was part of an intelligence group that were going after uh, Al Sada inside a city. So I went through the whole, you know, I said to these guys, look, this is a movie for you. And then I went about casting as many um, veterans and law enforcement or former law enforcement um, uh, people as possible. And that was I Am That Man. And it was actually the first movie, you know, the, the guys at, um, at AFES, which is, you know, the Army and Air Force Base, he thought it was so important that it's the first movie that they have ever taken into all the AFES around the world to go directly to theatres uh, without getting the general release in the USA or, or anywhere else in the world. It's the first movie they've ever done that. So I'm, I'm very, very proud of it, um, that it's it's doing what it's meant to have done. And obviously, I mean, you know, nobody goes out there to make a bad movie. Everyone goes out there to make a good movie. And I'm biased. I think that it's a good film. Um, and it's going to be out pretty soon for people to go watch. So, um yeah, thank you for mentioning that because I think, you know, my aim with that movie is if it saves one life or one marriage or, you know, gets people that are going through difficulties to talk um, and also encourages people out there to say, you know what, I can go and do this. I want to get into the movie industry and I can go and do this. Uh, certainly for veterans, uh, that I would have done my job. With yeah, that I, th film. I think you did it the right way. There's so many times that you hear just from – you know, things you read about some movies or TV shows that they'll use like the wrong terminology, like say if it's like a doctor spouting off something to like a patient and it's not something it's like, how did it even make it in there? But that's so cool that you had the wherewithal to like send it to people that you knew that could look at it and you know, you respected their opinion and that maybe that's why you got your first script sold. So you do a lot of things that you do it the first time, first audition, you have an album, you know, your first script gets bought. Is there anything else you're going to be trying in the next like few years? Do you play, do you, do you play the lottery? Oh, I think I should. I think. No, you know, like <laughs> I said, it's one of those things where, you know, if I see a barrier to what I want to do, I figure out how I'm going to get around it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, I'm not the kind of person that says I can do everything. Right. I'm not. But what I what I do do is I look at something and say, OK, for example, the movie industry has contracted as far as as far as making those middle level movies. Yeah. Right. Um, and so if I if I get frustrated with the quality of material that is coming to me and if it's either like either massive film or very small movie, then I'm not doing the kind of work that I really want to do. So. 
I'll go get it made. I'll go and approach people. I'll buy books. I'll, I'll, I'll buy the rights to certain books or, or get screenplays in that I really believe in, you know, and then I'll go and get it made. So it's more of a kind of, I don't believe in sitting on my backside and waiting for it to come to me. Definitely. I'll go out there and I'll make it happen, you know, um, and, and just keep going out there. And, and also again, like with that, with, with, I am that man, I got so frustrated with the, the, the quality of the films that came out and the way that they were portraying veterans. And I'd see these guys who were struggling every day and they deserve better. So I'm like, okay, I'll go do it. Because, and that's why, by the way, because in the movie, I wrote it, I directed it, and I starred in it. And the only reason why that happened was because I know that I'm going to turn up on set every day on time, knowing my lines. Yeah. And when you do a, a, a lower budget film, there's no skin. There's no fat, sorry. There's no fat that are, are on the production. You know, you've got to put every single thing into the production. And I couldn't, I, I didn't have the luxury of having an actor that didn't feel like turning up or didn't feel like learning his lines or, or had a problem with this or wanted to stay in his trailer and that. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to come out and do it. And I, I'm not going to, well, I'd say I won't do it again, but <laughs> I'd rather not do it again. I'd rather not do it. I'd like to direct again. I really enjoyed that. And the actors, uh, I think, do a really terrific job. And again, you know, I, I gave the actors, you know, the opportunity to improvise. Oh, great. Because I know what actors, I know what actors want. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got a couple of terrific performances. Tim Abel in it is, is staggering. His performance is absolutely staggering in the film. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of work. But I think that, you know, if people are frustrated with what they're seeing or want to, you know, they want to see different kinds of movies, go out and write. Um, know that your first draft is going to be absolutely terrible. And that's what Ken Nolan said to me. Ken Nolan goes, Matt, if you're going to write, he's a guy who wrote Black Hawk Down. He goes, if you're going to write, know that your first draft is going to be absolutely terrible. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He told me that and he said also get over 60 pages. And those are the two words of advice he gave to me. But so I, I, I think it's more, like I said, I love what I do. I love, you know, I'm, obviously you're doing a, a podcast about sequels. So you love film yeah. and I love film. I, I love watching it and I love being in it, um, being in them. I mean, being in the industry and I just, I'm a workaholic, man. And if, if the stuff isn't coming to me that I want to do, I'll go out and make it happen. I think that's that's awesome. the bottom line. And that's how you got, from, I hope you yeah, that's how you got from, you know, where you grew up in industrial town, West Bromwich. And, you know, you didn't, like you said, you didn't sit on your backside and look where you're at now. You're able to do so much. Yeah. And, and, you know, look, I mean, I think sometimes I, I didn't really appreciate at the time the amount, because in Hollywood, there's a, it's 99% about me momentum, right? So if you have momentum uh, and people, you know, people want you, that's why you see the same actors in a lot of movies. You know, they yeah. move from one to the next, the next, the next. Um, there's a lot of that. And I had a lot of that certainly earlier in my career. And um, that makes things a lot easier. Um, but you don't necessarily get all the films that you, you want. You know, I mean, there's, I, I had a bu there's a bunch of stuff that I was right down to the last two on that would make your hair curl if you knew. Yeah. And, and some of them go your way, some of them don't. I, I spoke to someone... Actually, someone on Twitter said to me, hey, listen, you know, my boyfriend went up for the same role as you for Coronation <laughs> Street. I was like, oh, man. And he, and he was gracious. He said, you know, he goes, look, the better guy got the role. You're better than him. And I'm like, well, that's subjective, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I'll take it. But, you know, it might have been on that day, you know, there's a little bit of luck. You know, I had momentum coming off the other show and, same thing with, um, you know, with Rambo, you know, St Stallone was looking for a particular kind of person and I fit the bill and I went in and on that day I nailed it. Um, there's a lot of that. Yeah. But there is an element of you've got to make your own luck as well, you know.
Definitely. You've got to you've got to make your own look by working hard. I mean, I'm up every day. I work out every single day. I write every day. Um, but you know, I, I love this industry. I love it. That's awesome, man. Well, Matt, this has been awesome, and I'm going to keep tabs on when I am that man. It's going to come out. But if you want to just shoot me an email, if you can remember, and then I'll make sure to put the link in, and I'll try to put the episode yeah. out right around that time so more people check it out. Is it going to be on like Amazon Prime or Netflix? We'll kind of. Yeah, yeah, it should be. I mean, we've been, like I said, I held on because I wanted, to, again, it was never about money for me. So yeah. we wanted to make the troops know that we were coming to them first. So, like I said, it was the first one. So we delayed doing our deals, our distribution deals, uh, until now. So we're doing the deals right now on that. And so it's going to be coming. Yeah, it's going to be coming out real soon. And I think that, you know, it's one of those movies where it'll get word of mouth. There's terrific performances in it. Um, And and I'm very, very proud of it. You know, I'm very proud of of, um, the guys that came in. There was no one on that film that didn't want to be there. And that's a, a really great thing. So I'm looking at doing my next one now. So Sweet, man. Yeah, I'll keep tabs on you. I'm sure you'll post it on like Twitter or Instagram. But uh, this has been great, Matt. Thanks so much for taking the time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Man, wasn't Matthew awesome? So two things I loved about him most was one – Gets a job, Blackhawk down. First thing he does, champagne, goes to his mom. Gotta, gotta show love to the mom. A big moment like that. That shows a lot about that guy. And two, I am that man. It has not out yet. I'm going to put all the links in the bio to his social media, his website, and I am that man's website. Hopefully it comes out soon. But the fact when I said, oh, are you talking to Amazon, Hulu? And he's like, money really doesn't matter. He just wanted to make a movie that really is what really how you know veterans feel man what a great guy you know all that training he did black hawk down back in like early 2000s uh it really stuck with him he really cares about the military and i respect him and uh matthew you're awesome if you're listening to this i hope so but now it's time to talk about your homework you have to go watch rambo it is on amazon prime for pre obviously you want to do it quick because our reviews next week It's good. We got into outfits. Pretty rad. Jamie actually dressed up for the first time. He did some bad uh, outfits in the past, but this one's really good. So, yeah, so it's on Amazon Prime. It's going to be off September 30th, so jump on it. And don't forget to review, rate, share our podcast. Follow us on all social media at Sequels Only. Don't forget, check out our website, SequelsOnly.com. Good night.